Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. The Glorious Revolution of 1688, called the Bloodless Revolution, doesn't get a lot of attention when talking about global political revolutions. Largely because it was bloodless. Compared to the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or even the American Revolution, it feels kind of meh. It's, what, a peaceful transfer of power? Well, yeah, but I would argue it's far more significant than we usually assume. The transfer of power that really mattered here was not the transfer from James II to William III. That's just another king changing places. I would argue that the Glorious Revolution was not the invasion of William III, but a, a quieter political revolution. The English Parliament was not exactly keen to hand power over to a Dutch king. In the horse trading that followed the invasion, the Parliament passed a ton of provisions which put strict limits on royal power and further strengthened the position of the Parliament. Which, yeah, I mean, that's not sexy, it's not exciting. We're talking about, what here, legislation? But it is super significant to the development of modern representative democracy. Thanks to the centuries of English tradition, I mean, we could trace this back to the Magna Carta or even before, the English were primed to forge their government into what we would recognize as something akin to a constitutional monarchy. And for that development, we could in part thank the new king, William III. He didn't care about English politics. You want to, what, draft a Bill of Rights that protects Protestants? Yeah, sure, great. I can still raise an army of Englishmen to fight France, right? Then do whatever you want. The invasion, in the eyes of William, was a consideration in the coming war with King Louis XIV. That attitude, I think, saved the English people a ton of suffering down the line when the rest of Europe was busy overthrowing kings and fighting wars to have their own bills of rights and constitutions. Now, we've talked about this revolution already. We're not going to go into the details of William's invasion, but the significance of this march towards modernity for us here on this show is the shift away from royal majesty and toward politics and politicians. Moving forward, we're going to have to be as concerned with prime ministers as we have been with kings and queens. Now, I'm not just going to throw a whole bunch of names at you at once. There are a lot of them. It would be overwhelming and not terribly interesting. Instead, I'm going to introduce the political players who will be relevant as they become so. However, there are two that will become the key figures in the English story moving forward. This is episode 165, Sarah and John. The office of Prime Minister didn't exist yet in England. It wouldn't exist until the kingdoms were united, but there was always someone who filled that role as the top political officer in England. Sometimes they would even be called the Chief Minister. Their official role was usually the Lord High Treasurer, but... Sometimes they were the Secretary of State or Lord High Admiral. Regardless, more and more they were taking up the role of what we would recognize as a Prime Minister. And since we're discussing Prime Ministers, it seems apt to begin with none other than Winston Churchill. But not that Winston Churchill. We're talking about Sir Winston Churchill, a distant ancestor of the famous 20th century Prime Minister. That Churchill was known as the Cavalier Colonel. As the name implies, during the Civil War, the Cavalier Colonel fought for the Royalist cause. When the Cavaliers lost and Cromwell took power, the Churchill family took significant hits to their fortune and their property. They were almost, but not quite, destitute. You know, they weren't broke how regular people go broke, they were broke how the nobility goes broke. And this was happening to a ton of royalist families all around the realm. Winston played a role in facilitating the Stuart Restoration, which restored his family to favor, but not to prosperity. Restoring that fortune fell upon the shoulders of Winston's son, John Churchill. 
John was only ten years old when the Stuarts returned to England, and when he reached manhood he appeared to follow in his father's footsteps as a, a cavalier deep in the royalist camp. By twenty-four, John Churchill was serving as second-in-command to King Charles' illegitimate son James, Duke of Monmouth. Monmouth and Churchill led a fierce cavalry regiment during the Third Anglo-Dutch War, and you can picture that kind of cabal of young and handsome, arrogant cavaliers fighting duels and romancing the ladies. Much of what you picture there is accurate, but I don't want you to write them off as a bunch of rich kids. They weren't all that rich, honestly. Their social standing wasn't exactly elite, either. They were all rogues from royalist families who suffered the same financial hardships as the Churchills, and they were led by a bastard. A royal bastard is nothing to scoff at. They often led military detachments, but they rarely led the most august units. That holds true here. These cavaliers gained a reputation as wild and ornery and rambunctious, dashing heroes. This put them in an interesting position, though, as outsiders to the regular army. When England concluded their arm of the war in 1674, Monmouth and Churchill volunteered their regiment to fight for King Louis. Remember, they ended that arm of the war largely due to the pressure concerning the alliance between the Bourbons and the Stuarts. It was a bit controversial when they sailed back to France. These royalist rogues, though, encouraged by the family to do so, the royal family, served France with distinction and earned a lot of honor for England. They served under and... This is really important, even if it doesn't seem so quite yet. They served under the tutelage of the Vicomte de Turenne, Marshal General of France. We all remember Turin, right? He was that military genius of King Louis's early reign. He was the commander who won the Fronde for the king and allowed him to keep his throne. Often, Turin is considered France's greatest military commander between maybe the Hundred Years' War and the Corsican Corporal. Now this was to be Turin's last campaign, but it's often considered his greatest military achievement. And when I say that Monmouth and Churchill served under Turin, I don't mean that they just took orders from his aide-de-camp. They did, but they were both there when those orders were decided upon. As top-ranking officers of an elite English regiment, one of them a royal bastard nonetheless, they sat in on all of Turin's councils and conferred with his top leaders. This was an internship with the greatest commander of the age. The young captains learned all about Turin's tactics, about his leadership style and his military organization. They would blend these lessons later in life with their own cavalier style a style that was often considered by the august old guard military veterans as reckless. They combined them to create something new and different. I want you to remember this tutelage under Turin when Churchill goes on to rebuild the English army into something that we would recognize as the 18th century British Empire army, maybe the most elite force in the world at the time. And it's here that we should introduce the other major player in this story. Now, this player was not a politician in any traditional sense. It would have been illegal. But she was a major force in English politics in the years to come. Her name was Sarah Jennings. She came from a prominent, if not a powerful, family. Her uncle served as physician to Charles I and his wife, Anne. That means that he oversaw the birth of both Charles II and James II. The Jennings family, thanks to that relationship, was favored by the Stuarts. Sarah Jennings served as a maid of honor to James' first wife, also named Anne. A maid of honor was like a lady-in-waiting, but usually younger and usually of a lower social standing. Sarah was only eleven when she became a maid of honor and it proved to be a lonely life for her first year. 
But then another girl who had been away returned to the court of the Stuarts. James' daughter, Anne. The two of them became fast friends. They were almost the same age, and before long they were nearly inseparable confidants. There are some who would suggest that their friendship would evolve later on into a romantic relationship, and usually when there are two people of the same sex in history that are very close inseparable friends, I mean, Sappho and her friend, right? But that doesn't appear to be the case here. We can say so thanks to the mountain of correspondence between the two, from which there's not a, a glimmer of anything like that. Now, I mention this friendship only in passing, to give a bit of historical flavor. In truth, it's just a blip on the radar. Nothing that's going to have any sort of impact down the line. I don't want you to be focusing on Anne. It's not like she's going to have the most famous pirate ship of all time named after her, or anything. And it's not like the reason that that ship was named what it was named had any kind of direct correlation to Anne's very close friend Sarah Jennings. That wouldn't be why I'm talking about this in the first place. See, Sarah Jennings was a devout Protestant. This should not have been noteworthy in England at the time, but when she arrived at court, she discovered that her Protestantism was very much out of the ordinary. Her older sister, Sarah's older sister, also served as a maid of honor and was born into the Jennings family as an Anglican. But she married a Catholic. This caused a bit of ruckus, a minor scandal. Some suggested that the Stuarts at court were pressuring girls into marriage with Catholics, the insinuation is that they intended to breed the Anglicanism out of the elite classes. It's dangerous to make assumptions about anyone's religious faith or their reasons for choosing it, but we can say that Sarah made a choice to stubbornly stick to her Protestant faith. And we should note that her best friend, Anne, daughter of a Catholic future king, although also daughter of a Protestant Englishwoman, that she chose to be a Protestant. I'm not saying that her friendship with Sarah is the reason she was a Protestant, but I'm sure when the pressure was on her to convert, as it certainly was at points in her life, her friendship with someone who held the same beliefs would have bolstered her. In 1671, James' wife, Anne's mother, died. The maids of honor and the ladies-in-waiting who served the queen might have been sent home, and some of them were, but Sarah stayed at court. I mean, what would you do in James' position? Your daughter had just lost her mother. Were you going to send her best friend in the whole wide world away? Of course not, you're not a monster. But Sarah was reinstated as a maid of honor when James remarried. That's when he remarried the Italian Catholic Mary of Modena. This was yet another Catholic at court, and in the eyes of Anne, likely an evil stepmother of sorts. It only deepened the bond between Sarah and Anne. This friendship, which I've spent a decent amount of time setting up, well, those of you who know the name of Sarah Jennings, those of you who have been reading ahead, know that this may be the most important relationship in this story. But maybe not. When Sarah was fifteen years old, a young, dashing, handsome Protestant cavalier arrived at court from his time overseas. Sarah was maybe surprised and probably pleased to see how warmly he was greeted by the royal family. John Churchill, twenty-five years old, was accomplished and very charming. Now, we know that this was when John and Sarah met for the first time, but we don't know any of the details about how or when they fell in love. We can be pretty certain that Anne knew everything, but this story is a love story, which is kind of odd for the time. There's no backbiting or political intrigue between the two, and certainly no poison. It did, though, start off a bit rocky, as the best love stories often do. See, John Churchill could have done better, socially and financially speaking. 
and he was pressured to do so in order to save his family's fortune. See, Sarah's family, who were royalist sympathizers, suffered the same misfortunes under Cromwell, for the same reasons as the Churchill family. John was intended to marry another woman with huge tracts of land. He suggested to Sarah at one point that maybe she could be his mistress. Like an official mistress. It's totally legit, I swear. When I was in France, and you know he never shut up about his year abroad, when I was in France, everyone had a mistress. It was the thing to do. But Sarah, who throughout her life would prove to be self-assured and very forthright for her time, she put her foot down and demanded that he put a ring on it. John Churchill, to his credit, did so. Now, if you don't know this story, you're probably wondering why I'm spending so much time on these two courtiers. And I don't want to give too much away here, but in a few short years, Sarah Churchill will be what we would see as England's first lady, maybe their first first lady. They are key figures in that shift away from royal majesty and toward political power. We don't know when the two got married. The ceremony was held in secret, but not secret from the royal family. They knew all about it, and they approved. It was done in secret so that Sarah could remain at court and serve as a maid of honor. She would have probably moved in with her husband, but her husband was about to be sent overseas once again. When England re-entered the Franco-Dutch War in 1678, this time on the side of the Netherlands, John Churchill sailed for Amsterdam to organize an expeditionary force. They were intended to ride for William III, the Prince of Orange. This was probably when John Churchill met the Stadtholder, and I wonder if there was a point of contention that the Cavalier had fought earlier in the war under Turin. Probably not, though. Everyone, even the Dutch, admired and respected the Marshal General. It would have been seen as an honor to have served under him. It was likely his first time meeting Mary, William's wife. However, Churchill was a mainstay at the royal court at this point. His personal news of the royal family and his news of Anne, Mary's younger sister, would have ingratiated him. That expeditionary force never amounted to much. The war ended shortly thereafter, largely because England agreed to fight on the side of the Dutch. But this meeting here is significant, for obvious reasons. Later that year, 1678, John Churchill was elected to the Parliament. This was during the heart of the exclusion crisis, in which the Parliament attempted to exclude James from the throne for being a Catholic. Sir John, who was a friend to the Stuarts, served as their parliamentary liaison. His wife began to show signs of pregnancy, and their marriage was announced to the public. In the years that followed, John navigated the exclusion crisis, and the Churchills had a whole pack of kids. Sarah and Anne kept up their friendship, and the Churchills rebuilt their fortune. They were prosperous years, financially and personally for the couple. But then in 1685, King Charles died and James became king. He disbanded the parliament. That means he no longer required a liaison to the parliament, but John and Sarah continued to be regulars. Then crisis hit England. In what was a really fascinating turn of events, the illegitimate Protestant son of Charles II the Duke of Monmouth, made his claim on the crown and went into open rebellion. Monmouth was, of course, Churchill's old friend and one-time commander in that cavalry regiment. King James, in what was a bold and even inspired move, appointed Sir John to a leadership position in the force that was sent against Monmouth, maybe as a bit of a test to his loyalty. Churchill wasn't an overall command of the force, but he was basically number two. Remember that Churchill had been at all of those councils under Turin. He had helped develop the tactical style 
that defined their regiment. He did so alongside the Duke of Monmouth, and he personally knew most of the men that led forces under the Duke. He'd once commanded many of them. He knew better than any other commander in England how to counter Monmouth's rebellion. In the end, though the commander still won all the honors, John Churchill was credited with winning the campaign by that commander. There's a possibility that, had King James not tapped Churchill for that leadership role, things could have ended very differently in English history. We could have had a King James III right here in the person of the Duke of Monmouth. In the aftermath of the rebellion, John Churchill, whose loyalty had been proven, found himself to be a favorite of the king's. He was nowhere near what we would consider a de facto prime minister, but he was the guy that the king turned to for a ton of political matters. He was in the inner circle. And that makes his decision in 1688 really fascinating. John Churchill turned on the king and began plotting to overthrow James Stuart. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the political maneuvers that Churchill displayed here, but they're impressive. He managed to remain, in the eyes of the king, a loyal kingsman. He was in the favor of James II throughout all of this. Simultaneously, he was establishing his Protestant parliamentarian credentials to his fellows, and, known to but a very few, he was actively plotting to overthrow the king. If you'd like to read more about it and this whole era, I would recommend the books Rebellion and Revolution by Peter Ackroyd. They are digestible histories about this entire era, covering roughly the time from 1630 to 1776. And he's got a whole series, if you like them, that goes back to the Tudors and before. Ackroyd writes of John Churchill, and he calls him Marlborough here, but John Churchill is not yet the Duke of Marlborough in our story. He says, quote, Marlborough had all the makings of a modern patriot. He was handsome, clever, and resourceful, an excellent general, and a politician of persuasive manner. He had distinguished himself in the service of the Duke of York, and had never been out of favor. He was inclined to support whatever or whoever indulged his interests, whether for power, money, or further honors, while all the time remaining tactful, modest, and obliging. End quote. Whoever or whatever indulged his interests. Which raises the question, what were those interests exactly? Why was there this sea change in John Churchill? Why did he turn his coat against the king? Which could be expanded, John Churchill was not alone. A number of men in the king's inner council turned their coats as well at almost the exact same time, including the king's own chief minister. Well, in Churchill's case, I think the first thing to note is that he was a singularly skilled political player. He could read the writing on the wall, he could see the way the wind was blowing concerning the king, and he chose to throw his lot in with the winning side. His family had lost everything fighting for a doomed Stuart in the last revolution, Perhaps Churchill thought he could direct events if he took a leading role in the plot. That is what happened, at any rate. Then there was the religious question. Churchill was loyal to King James, but he was a Protestant. James appeared to be plotting to disband the Anglican Church and return England to Catholicism. That was, for a time in 1688, the rumor. Now, that rumor is deeply disputed, but we need to remember that John Churchill was not one to be guided by rumors. He was the one who guides the rumors. But I don't see John Churchill as this Machiavellian puppet master. I see him as an adroit political mover and shaker. That's what he was. But his wife, on the other hand, Sarah, might just be a Machiavellian puppet master. Now, all I have to argue that point is circumstantial evidence and suppositions, but let's assume for a minute that James was indeed plotting to disband the Anglican Church. He would very likely not have shared these plans with even one of his favorites, if that favorite, like Churchill, was a Protestant. However, 
his daughter Anne would very possibly have been privy to this kind of plot. If that were the case, Anne, a Protestant, would certainly have shared it with her friend Sarah, who certainly would have shared it with her husband. Indeed, these three kind of form a little cabal, a Protestant niche within the court of King James, who were certainly working against some of his greater machinations. Now, I don't think that James was indeed planning to do anything of the sort. However, the rumor that he was did wind up working out very well for the Churchills, and arguably even better for Anne. And we also shouldn't ignore the possibility of genuine religious devotion. Sir John may have been honestly concerned for the souls of the English people. They would have been in his eyes at least, doomed to damnation should England lapse back into Catholicism. And even if it wasn't that, if it wasn't salvation on his mind, there were questions of tradition and identity that are always caught up in religion. Now, I don't think that's why Churchill did what he did, at least not the primary motivator, but it is possible. More to the point, and I think this motivated everyone, was the birth of James' son, a male Catholic heir was too much for most English people. They could stomach James, they could put up with him for a few years because following in his footsteps would be his daughter, Mary, who was a Protestant. But now that there was a Catholic on the way, a young, young man, well, that was too much to bear. I think that in a lot of ways, though, what really motivated John Churchill and many of his compatriots was patriotism honest patriotism. I think that for men like James Chief Minister, the Earl of Sunderland, that was why they joined the plot as well, the well-being of their countrymen. All of those members of the King's inner circle who were working against James, well, they had their own motivations, but I don't see what they did as a betrayal of the King. They all saw that civil war was on the horizon, it was imminent, it was coming. The Whigs and the Tories were gathering all of their forces for war right now. So these men, who were closest to the king, chose to take proactive action. They decided to guide the revolution, which kept it from getting out of hand. There's a reason it's the bloodless revolution, and it's because of these players. These players who chose to plot with William and Mary. And I should note that there was never a plan to install William as king. They were all pushing for Mary to sit the throne and intended to see it done with a Dutch army. But her husband, a foreigner, would properly have been a royal consort. He would have been influential, absolutely, but a consort is divested of any kind of official power or dynastic claim. That was the situation for the first Queen Mary, Mary Tudor. She was married to King Philip II of Spain, and despite all of the rumors of who actually held the reins of power, Philip II was never the King of England. But William, he outplayed everyone. Following this bloodless invasion of Dutch troops and English exiles, William went before the Parliament. There, still coated in the dust of his march, William forced his will upon the English. He demanded to be made king. Not the sole ruler of England, but a co-monarch with his wife. That would mean, though, that he had all of the rights and privileges of his station. And remember that he made this demand with 14,000 Dutch troops at his back, with a fleet sitting in the seas around London. This was not a savvy political move, nothing of the sort that John Churchill was so accomplished. This was the decree of a king. Parliament agreed. They had very little choice. But William left and began organizing the English armed forces to attack France. As we said earlier, that was the whole point, and he involved Churchill in that. We'll talk about that next time. But the Parliament, who we should remember, wanted to attack France just as much as William, well, they left him to it. Meanwhile, while the king was occupied, the parliament drafted legislation that empowered the parliament. Most notably, it divested the king from his power to call 
or disband the legislative body. They were now to be a standing, elected body. This was huge. It changed everything in English politics, but William, who was still commander-in-chief, didn't care. Churchill, even though he was involved in all of this legislation, was still dissatisfied. Even though he was invested with new noble title, as we'll get to next time, he was unhappy with what had just transpired. I think it may have had something to do with William's succession thwarting his plans to put maybe his wife's best friend on the throne. But most historians tell us that John Churchill's next moves were merely covering his bases. Throughout the year 1689, John Churchill was in correspondence with members of a new political faction in English politics, a faction that will define our story moving forward, Jacobites. Churchill himself was not a Jacobite, but he was a dangerous political force and a force who reportedly had been in contact with the deposed King James. British historian Thomas Macaulay wrote, quote, William was not prone to fear, but if there was anyone on earth that he feared, it was Marlborough. End quote. In 1689, after more than a decade away from home and years in foreign seas, William Dampier was aboard an English ship anchored in the Malaccas. He received word that his old friend and shipmate, the ship's doctor on board Signet, Herman Coppinger, was aboard another ship in the harbor. Dampier took a boat over. The last time Dampier had seen Herman Coppinger, the surgeon was being forcefully detained by the Signet pirates. That was while well. Dampier was preparing to abandon the ship. The ship Dampier approached was flying a Danish flag, and when he pulled up alongside, every Dane on board had, quote, a gun in his hand. Soon enough, though, Coppinger came to the rail and saw Dampier. He told everyone to stand down. Coppinger had his own odyssey to tell, including capture by Malacca pirates. However, once they discovered he was a doctor, they made use of his services, and in thanks they dropped him off at a Portuguese outpost. There, Coppinger was taken on by this Danish ship to serve as a doctor on their return to Europe. Now that's all fascinating, but Coppinger had other news to share, big news. The King of England, James II, had been deposed. He didn't have many details. The Danes had only just learned of it before leaving, but reportedly James' eldest daughter, Mary, sat the throne. Dampier was understandably surprised by the news, but this was three or four pieces of news all at once. Likely he didn't even know that Charles II had died and that James was, for a few years, king. The last reliable news he received was probably in Virginia in 1683. Now, I love these kinds of stories, that that moment when people who have been far from home for years hear news that changes their world. You know, there were French fur traders that came out of the wilds of Louisiana only to learn that their king had been executed and France was in the hands of the people. There were American pioneers and settlers that didn't hear about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln for months or maybe even a couple of years. This is something that we've lost in the modern world. You know, we know about all of the big events, sometimes while they're actively happening. With the advent of radio and TV and, of course, the Internet, we all get our current events currently. That gives everyone the opportunity to react in real time, which usually means sharing their opinions, which I think we can all agree is the worst, even when we're busy slamming away on our own keyboards. But news traveled a little differently in the early modern world, it took months following the Glorious Revolution for English and Scottish men and women to hear the news, and they did so in waves. The news was followed by, well, the emotions differed. 
In some circles you would find joy and jubilation and people toasting the revolution, but in others you would find shock and despair, disbelief and anger. The revolution happened so fast, though, that nobody had an opportunity to react before it happened. Once the cat was out of the bag, well, they have the same inclinations we all do. They wanted to share their opinions, but without the internet, they had to do so much more directly. This is episode 166, Jacobites. I suppose we should start with the definition. What was a Jacobite? If you look deeply enough, it can become a complicated question. But on the surface, a Jacobite was simply a person who supported the restoration of James Stuart. The name James is derived from the Latin Jacobus, hence Jacobites. But even the name is controversial. The word began as a pejorative. They used the Latin name in an attempt to remind people that Catholic James was linked, as well as his supporters, to Rome. But it failed as a piece of propaganda, kind of like that faction in the ancient Roman Republic that were dubbed Optimates by their enemies. Some Jacobites adopted the name. They threw it back in their enemies' faces. In that respect, the link to Rome, it can be indicative of their ideology. Or some of their ideologies. Jacobites weren't unified at all in their philosophy. If they'd had a uniformity in their thought, as much as they had a uniformity of purpose, they maybe could have won. But of course, they're not going to win. Now, I've debated how much time to spend on each of these individual Jacobite ideologies. I had a whole episode about it, but I didn't like it. It's totally unrelated to piracy and really not that interesting. Instead, I'm just going to break the Jacobites down into three main groups, broadly speaking. First, you have the Catholics. As James was the last Catholic king of England, he was supported by most, but not all, Catholics in the British Isles. That means mainly a lot of Irish people. This was not the origin of the... I'm not really sure what word is strong enough. The tension? It's not the origin of the tension between the English and the Irish people, but it would be a source of continued tension for years to come. Then the second group were, if we were to leave theological and ideological concerns out of it, they were the Scots. The House of Stuart, of course, came from Scotland. They had a lot of support from Stuart loyalists and members of their family in their homeland. That was, in fact, my introduction to Jacobitism. Kind of. In the Liam Neeson movie Rob Roy, there's a bad guy nobleman that whispers of his rival in the region being a Jacobite. Gasp! But that's decades later, in the mid-1700s. The third group, though, are more difficult. They have no easy national distinction. They come from everywhere in Europe. The thing that ties them together, really that ties all Jacobites together on some level, is a belief in the divine right of kings. They believed that in the overthrow of James II, God would smite all of England into damnation for dethroning his chosen king. At least that's what those factions would say. It may not have been the case in truth. See, a lot of that group are foreign. A lot of French and Spanish and German and Danish, basically from everywhere. The question is, though, were they honest actors worried about English souls, or were they cynical actors? Those who intended to work against their nation's official policy for personal gain. Probably a bit of both, in every soldier and in every army. We're going to spend a good deal of time on that question in the weeks to come, but I want to begin today with James II. Is it even appropriate to call him James II after the Revolution? James Stuart and his wife, Mary of Modena, along with their infant son, James Francis Edward Stuart, and a few other notables, fled London in the face of William's invasion. 
James sent his family on to France, but he stayed in England to attempt to raise an army. However, the soldiers just weren't there. There were too many nobles and far too many officers, and too many soldiers that were unwilling to raise arms against Mary, who had until very recently been their expected heir. So James gave up his quest for now, then he prepared to board a ship for France, but inevitably he was captured. The greatest sin of James II, a sin he shared with his brother and his father, was arrogance. They had a belief that they were actually ordained by God. I don't believe that, but I do recognize that there are many people in the world who still revere the Stuarts and the Habsburgs, and they do so from a place of genuine religious faith. But if James was chosen by God to be king, he failed in his mission. It's like that joke about the guy who was trapped on his roof during a flood. He prays to God that he would be saved. And a few minutes later, a log floats by, and he thinks, no, no, God will save me. Then a guy in a canoe comes by to rescue him. Again, no, God will save me. Finally, a helicopter shows up. No, God will save me. And of course, he drowns. And when he gets to heaven, he asks God, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent a log and a canoe and a helicopter. What else do you want from me? James, well, he could have saved his reign. The former Lord High Admiral had one of the best navies in the world. They lived on an island. But he failed to employ them. And James wasn't stupid. Militarily especially, he was quite talented. But he failed to use those skills. When he tried to flee England, James could have escaped. But he would have had to take steps that he was not willing to not to be noticed. He marched boldly to his ship. However, though he was captured, as anyone could have guessed, he might have been right. Conventional wisdom would expect James to be imprisoned or executed, but that's not what happened. Mary realized that executing her father or even just imprisoning him was not only uncalled for, but it was a dangerous move politically. So William and Mary let James go. He sailed on to France, free. And he stayed there for a while, but he began to receive correspondence while in France. Most of it came from his supporters on the continent, those foreign people we mentioned who could arguably be called Jacobites. He began receiving letters from British and Irish people as well. Supporters, mostly, but more interesting were the letters he received from men who had, just a few months earlier, plotted to see him overthrown. They weren't exactly throwing their support behind him, and they weren't even apologizing, usually, but they were explaining their position. They were downplaying their role. They were trying to save their hides just in case James should win. There were a number of these, high-profile names, too. James' one-time chief minister, the Earl of Sunderland, for example. But in the interest of continuity, I'm going to focus on John Churchill, who we talked about last time. After James fled England, the new monarchs William and Mary held their official coronation. As is tradition, and as is practical, they began to ennoble those who had served them on their way to the crowns. John Churchill was created the Earl of Marlborough. He was also added to the Privy Council and made a Knight of the Bedchamber. These were huge honors. Churchill, though, Marlborough properly at this point, he was still something of an outsider in every circle. The Jacobites and I'm going to call them the Jacobites, but that's not really accurate yet, but it describes supporters of the deposed king. The Jacobites saw this cavalcade of honors coming Marlborough's way, and they grew to despise him. They saw him as a turncloak. But William, despite all of these honors, didn't trust Marlborough either. 
He was a well-known favorite of James. He was in James' camp, literally in his military camp, when William was already on English soil. Now, of course, Marlborough organized the invasion, and he abandoned James' camp very publicly, and that may have saved his life. But really, it's his wife's friendship with the queen's little sister that earned him his place at court. Anne pushed for Marlborough to be on the Privy Council. However, it was his own military accomplishments and Marlborough's popularity with the army that earned him such a high role in the military. Now, he wasn't in the highest of positions, and in fact, some of this it's hard to say what's truth and what was later amended by Marlborough, but he says that he was one of the highest military officers that actually handled military affairs. His immediate superiors were flatterers and courtiers to King William. Of course, to his credit, King William was a commander-in-chief that actually did the job. In 1690, he personally sailed off to Ireland, and he took most of those courtiers with him. He did so because James Stuart arrived at the head of a French army to rally the Irish Jacobites, but we'll get to that. First, though, this was a huge boon to Marlborough. When William left London, he left Marlborough in charge of the army in England. Now, I'm not sure if it was his status as a less-than-trustworthy commander, or if it was a show of faith on the part of the king. Maybe it was a test of his faithfulness, but Marlborough made the most of his new office. The Master General of the Ordinance was a position of great honor and great responsibility in the English army. It was disbanded in 2013 and handed over to a civilian office, but it was a hugely important position in the 20th century. The Master General of the Ordinance oversaw the artillery, but in the time of two world wars and the nuclear age, artillery was a big deal. Now, Marlborough was not the Master General of the Ordinance. Not yet, at least, but his immediate superior was. However, that man was one of those courtiers we mentioned. He's, well, the word flunky is often bandied about with his name. King William loved all of the things kings are supposed to love, like horses and swords and knights and duels. So he kind of ignored the artillery but he also loved winning battles, so he gave Churchill a very long leash in procuring arms for England. The Earl of Marlborough took that power and began to reform the army into something that we would see as almost modern. The pike formations guarding slow-moving, slow-loading, slow-firing musketeers, they were on their way out. Marlborough's first big advancement was to order thousands of flintlock muskets. Now, this is going to be huge when we get to the war, but of course, the flintlock is a giant in the story of piracy. If you had a pirate gun, a toy pirate gun, growing up, I guarantee it was a flintlock. Before this time, they were still using matchlocks that had a lit bunt that snapped down to fire the powder, they weren't great on land, but they were terrible at sea. The bunts went out all the time. The flintlock looks extremely modern. It has a metal hammer that strikes a piece of flint to create a spark to light the powder. It's so much better at sea, it's incalculable. And thanks to Marlborough's massive order of thousands of these fantastic guns, they began to filter into private hands. In part, that was the black market and battlefield scavengers, but now that they had been forced to design new flintlock muskets, many of the manufacturers produced these better, cheaper guns in mass. Before long, they were the standard small arm. From this point on, we can picture the pirates almost exclusively using flintlock muskets, as well as the English army. The British Army's focus on things like rate of fire, the tactics that would conquer the world in the British Empire, well, they began here. 
Perhaps even more important and less talked about was Marlborough's focus on speed and mobility. He built legions of what looked very much like French dragoons, maybe thanks to Turin's influence here. That means they rode horses. Now, they weren't cavalry, they just rode horses to and from the battle, but that means they were able to arrive on the scene and choose their location before the enemy. Then, given their lack of armor and fast-firing capability, they could dominate a battlefield. It was a revolution in military affairs. For a moment here, and this will come into play later, the Royal Navy had flintlock muskets, but the private naval mercenaries that ruled the seas did not. It gave the Navy a huge advantage and really dampened piracy for several years. But back to Ireland. James Stuart landed on the 12th of March, 1689, with 6,000 French troops at his back. This was the opening move in what is called the Williamite War, or the Williamite-Jacobite War. But if you pull back and look at the bigger picture, this was merely a move in the Nine Years' War, as was the Glorious Revolution, but this move in Ireland was an outflanking maneuver. The fight that was coming may have been a fight between two rival English kings on Irish soil but it also wasn't. It was a fight between the Prince of Orange of the Netherlands and the King of France. Make no mistake here, without King Louis's support, James Stuart would never have been able to mount a force, and Louis certainly would not have spent the resources on this invasion if it were not militarily advantageous. See, the war was already well underway, We've focused on the Glorious Revolution, but while that was happening on the continent, France was on the move. Keep in mind, though, that the Nine Years' War is... That's a later name for the conflict. Nobody at the time thought it would be a Nine Years' War. They all said it would be a quick war. That's what they said about every conflict. But at first, Louis fought it as just another semi-annual campaign to capture land in Flanders. It looked very much like parts of the Franco-Dutch War and the War of the Reunions. Louis's armies marched on fortress cities in the contested land west of the Rhine. They bombarded the walls and besieged the people until they eventually capitulated and handed their flag to France. This was an old style of war. William, though, rather than send his armies south to fight the same war again. He sailed for England. He cut off the British Isles from Louis's camp. It was a massive coup in the war. It could also be argued that, in doing so, William extended the war to come, turned it into the Nine Years' War. He opened up a whole new front in the fighting. This was not going to be yet another campaign of bombarding fortress cities. It would start off that way, but it was going to turn into so much more. The Williamite-Jacobite War in Ireland, the actual fighting, I mean, isn't super important to our story. It culminated at the Battle of the Boyne River. The two sides, the English side led by William and the Irish-French force led by James, they drew up on either side of the river, each of them on hillsides leading down to the Boyne River at the bottom of the valley. They each hoped that the other side would attempt to push the river, to cross and charge. They would have been able to fire down with impunity on anyone who did so, but of course, nobody did so. Instead, they sat on their respective sides of the river and fired at one another with their big guns, occasionally maybe striking the army on the other side. The Protestant Williamites, though, did wind up winning the day. There was an irregular cavalry regiment. By irregular we mean, of course, not formally trained. They were recruited from the militias around the area. That means that they knew the land, though. 
They rode down river to an out-of-view, out-of-the-way river crossing. Then they flanked the forces of James and came up behind the Jacobites. Unexpected, they crashed into their forces. And once James was forced to turn around and deal with that, William ordered his men across the river, and they were surrounded. James and the French broke and fled. They ran back to France. The Irish would feel betrayed by this for years to come, but for now, the battle was over. Of course, the fighting in the Williamite War would continue for many years. As it happens, it would be under the direct command of the Earl of Marlborough in the years to come, his first direct military command. But that's an Irish-Jacobite rebellion, not necessarily a theater of the Nine Years' War. The biggest consequence of this conflict was the Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. The influence that the Battle of the Boyne and the Williamite War would have on Irish independence movements is difficult to calculate. But everybody knew immediately that the tide had turned. From the moment that the battle ended up until today, it's been a part of the Irish experience, and not necessarily a happy part. The 11th and 12th of July are celebrated to this very day by North Irish Protestants. On 11th night, they burn huge bonfires, and on the 12th, they march the route that William took to the Battle of the Boyne to, once and for all, defeat what they see as the Irish people. These marches are led by a fraternal Protestant order there in Northern Ireland called the Orange Order after King William. Of course, they can't actually get to the battlefield. The Battle of the Boyne happened in what is today the Republic of Ireland. They're not about to let a bunch of drunken orangist Protestants into their country to cause a ruckus, and along their route in Northern Ireland there have been clashes in recent years. It's still a tense situation. Throughout the 20th century and the rebellion in 1916, up until the Troubles, the Battle of the Boyne was always a, a firebrand of an issue. This is all fascinating stuff in the story of Irish independence, but it's not a pirate story. Next time, though, we are returning to a pirate's tale. We're going to travel back across the Atlantic to North America. There we're going to examine the American Jacobite reaction to the revolution. And we're going to talk about one of the very few famous Jacobite pirates, Thomas Pound. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon. Anyone who has left us a rating or a review wherever you listen to the show everybody who has donated through the website, and everybody who has recommended this show to your friends and family, online or in real life, all of you make it possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as usual, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. As always, most importantly, thank you for listening.